good morning. Good morning. It's good to see each and every one of you here this morning. Trust you've come for no other purpose but to worship King Jesus. Amen? It's good for you to be here. It's good for all of us to come together in God's house. And if you are visiting with us for the very first time, we want to say welcome. We want you to feel right at home. Uh, if you'll look there in the chair in front of you, somewhere around there, you'll find a Connect card. Please take the time to fill that Connect card out, and then you can do one of two things with it. You can put it in one of the uh, black offering boxes that are located throughout the sanctuary and also out in the foyer. Uh, you can uh, drop that in there uh, yourself, or you can hand deliver that to one of the pastors, and we would be delighted to meet you and uh, get to know a little bit about you. That gives us a record of your visit. also gives us a way to get in contact with you should you have any questions or um, just some thoughts. We'd love to sit down and talk with you. Um, and then on the back of that same card, you'll find a place for prayer needs. Anything that you have going on in your life or perhaps in the life of someone that you're aware of, uh, that you're at liberty to share that prayer need, we would count it the greatest privilege to be able to join with you and pray over that need. Uh, it's one of the highlights of our week as a staff as we uh, go to the Lord in prayer over these cards that are submitted. And so I'm just so very thankful for you taking the time. We count it the greatest joy to be able to join with you in praying over those needs. All right, just a, a couple of announcements real quick. Um, we've got a, a new members class coming up on 419 and 426. Uh, that sign-up's out in the Welcome Center, so make sure that you sign up for that. Pastor Matt is the one that'll be leading that. It's our way to uh, connect with the church body, and so if you're looking to join or Maybe you have questions about Calvary Road that you don't really know the answer to yet and you're considering joining the church and how you go about doing that. Those are great classes to attend, so make sure that you get signed up for that. Christ in Culture is coming up on, uh, well, that's today, isn't it? 423, today, this afternoon at 430. Things just sneak up on you. So this is a good class to come to. Uh, apologetics kind of uh, circling around parenting right now, I believe. Is that, nope, nope, just kidding. New topic. New topic, all right. Shows how informed I am, so there you go. All right, um, and then uh, if you are still in need of a mowing schedule, please make sure if you signed up to mow, make sure you come see me and I will give you your schedule. Uh, the way it has worked out this year, and I want to say personally thank you to each and every person who's volunteered of their time. Uh, right now, um, uh, it, the way it's going to break down is literally teams are going to be about two times the entire mowing season. So please just make sure to uh, uh, come by and see me if you need a mowing schedule. We are having family night. Um, oh, excuse me, skipped one. 29th. We're going to have a work day here at the church, all right? April 29th, 9 a.m. There will be weed eating. So if you've got a weed eater, make sure you bring that with you. Uh, those banks behind the church back here, they, uh, they don't cut themselves. Uh, and so uh, there'll be a work day going on that, that morning. Uh, family night, May the 31st. That will be from 6 to 8. It'll be our Wednesday evening activity for that night. We'll have food trucks, bounce houses, and a whole lot of fun. So you come be a part of that. Also, the Mother's Day tea. Uh, that's for uh, Mother's Day. It'll be on May 7th, right after the church. Uh, service that morning and then uh, you just need to sign up for that in the welcome center and then also the truth finder bible drill your kids will be participating in that um, amy is that on the third uh, on uh, the third of may so make sure you make uh, plans to be a part of that and then there'll be a, a reception that'll follow after okay all right i think that gets all the announcements covered i think we can breathe for a few minutes uh, a few minutes. We're glad that you're here. I'm going to ask, if you will, to stand up. We're going to have a time of fellowship. And as we have a time of fellowship, if the kids will make their way to the front for our children's story.
kiddos will have their children's story. In less than 100 days, we'll be taking our campers to summer camp. And that was just a brief picture of what camp will be for them. We have 15 children going, and we're so excited. Miss Laura and I will be going as counselors. And these kids are so excited about going. So if your child is nine years old by September or getting ready to go up through the seventh grade, they're more than welcome to join us. And adults, if any of you are willing to sponsor one of these children, we do have a few that still need some sponsorship. So if you could come see me, we would greatly appreciate that. Well, boys and girls, today I've got a special story for you. Are you ready? All right. So look up here. Hmm. Which one do you guys think you'd want? This side or this side? Hmm. How many of you would like the one with the cupcake, the cookies, the bread, the bread? Raise your hand. Yeah, adults, you can raise your hand too. That would be me, yeah. Okay, and then, oh, and even there's Pepsi in there. I had to get that in, you know. All right, and then over here, we've got carrots and beets and peppers and lettuce and broccoli and water. How many would like that? Oh, good, all right. Would you like that every single day for the rest of your life? No, okay. Well, there in the Bible, we're gonna talk about Daniel today. Daniel was forced to make a decision. He needed to either follow what God had said or do what he wanted to do for himself and follow what the king had planned. And so when the people were held captive, they came into with King Nebuchadnezzar into Babylon and he looked for the handsomest, the smartest, the strongest, because he wanted these people to work in his kingdom and be some of his top men. And so when they came into the city, they were given teachers. Teachers are great things, aren't they? They help us to learn things that we need to know. Well, these teachers were going to teach them how to live in the palace. And then they put a spread of food out before them that might have looked something like this. You know, if you were in the palace, you'd probably get steak every day, all the dessert you ever wanted, all the yummy stuff. That would be kind of cool, huh? But remember, what was the king trying to do? Make the strongest and the smartest, right? Well, Daniel remembered back to when he first started following after God and listening to what God said. And God had given him a command to eat vegetables and water. Was that what the king was offering? No. And so Daniel had a choice to make. He had to either do what the king wanted him to do or what pleased God. And so Daniel went to some of these advisors and he said, let me ask you a question. He said, for 10 days, can my friends and I eat just vegetables and water? And after 10 days, you come see if we're strong and if we're wise and we're still doing okay. And the servant said, all right, you go ahead, you do that. So for 10 days, they just ate vegetables and water. After 10 days, when they came back, the king's servants looked and they said, wow, you guys look stronger 
and wiser than the other people that had been eating this food. You know, God was pleased because Daniel and his friends, and let me tell you his friend's name, they're a little bit different. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Have you ever heard them, guys? Mm -hmm. Those four boys made the choice to follow what God had said. God wanted them to do. Hey, guys, can you guys listen? Callie, can you listen to story time? God's choice was what he wanted them to follow. But they had to choose. They had to make that choice. We talked about the wilds. When I was a young girl, I went there as a camper. And there was a preacher that came and he taught us a lesson. He said, you have two choices in your life. And I've got that right down here. Kind of like two books. You can either please God or you can please yourself. And so Daniel and his friends Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego chose to please who? God. And God blessed them for that. But could he have very easily chosen to please himself and eaten what the king offered? Yeah. Do you think he might have been as blessed by doing what pleased himself? No. Because God's ways are perfect. He has a perfect plan for us. So boys and girls, you're going to have choices this week. You're going to make a choice, maybe not about a food, but maybe a friend falls down on the playground and gets hurt. You can make a choice to either please God by helping them get up, take them to the teacher and let them get some help that they need. Or you could just please yourself by walking away and say, I'm not going to bother. But if you do the choice of pleasing God, that makes him so happy. Because that's what he wants us to do. We're a witness. And that's what Daniel and his friends were being. They were being a witness. They made a choice to please God. So this week, let's say this together. Are you going to please God or please self? So I'm going to give you a little phrase to remember. There are two choices on the shelf. Please God or please self. You guys say that with me. There are two choices on the shelf. Please God or please self. Think about that this week, okay? Thanks for listening, guys. You are great listeners. Can you take that to Miss Christy? Well, church family, it's such a joy for us to be able to come and, and celebrate when a, a young person comes to faith in Christ, and uh, we're just so excited today. Um, this is, this is uh, Callie, and Callie came uh, a couple of weeks ago on Easter Sunday. She was here with us, and uh, when it came time for the invitation, she came forward and uh, prayed and trusted Christ, and we're so very thankful for that, so very thankful for that decision that she has made uh, in her life, and she has with her here today uh, her her dad, John, and her mom, Tracy, and so we're so very thankful for that. It's our opportunity as a church family to love on her and to encourage her, and so, uh, Callie, have you asked Jesus Christ to be your personal Lord and Savior? Yes. Amen. Amen. It's upon that profession of faith and obedience to the command given to us by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's my privilege to baptize you this morning, my sister, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life. There's another towel, she needs one.
Well, good morning, church. Don't take this the wrong way, but you look a little sleepy this morning. Everybody doing okay? Well, to wake you up just a little bit, we're going to invite you to stand with us. Get that blood flowing just a little. And we're about to sing a song called, Oh, Praise the Name. What better thing could we do this morning than to stand together and sing praises to the name of Jesus, who is worthy of all of our worship and all of our praise. You worship with us this morning. Oh, praise the name of the Lord. 
Church family, we're getting ready to pray for who's your one. Uh, that's a time that's set aside in our service where we pray over the lost, people who we know who do not know the Lord personally. And uh, it's our great honor and our great joy to be able to lay their name before the Lord. I'm so very thankful for so many of you that continue to pray for my cousin. And I want to tell you that the Lord is at work. Um, I'd love to be up here this morning and tell you that he's trusted Christ as his Savior and Lord, but there's still a lot of work to be done, and I believe that it's God's will that he come to faith in Christ. Uh, it's just a matter of time. Just continue to join with me in praying for him, and we continue to join with each of you in praying over the names that you've submitted to this box because we know that it is God's desire for all to come to faith. Uh, it's not his will that any should perish, but that they should trust him as Savior and Lord before it's everlastingly too late. Uh, we, we take this time very seriously, so if you will, bow your head, close your eyes, and let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for the joy of being able to come before your throne. And Lord, to be able to do so on behalf of others is one of the greatest responsibilities we have as believers in Christ. Father, we know that you love us and you've demonstrated that love for us in that while we were yet sinners, you sent your son, the Lord Jesus, to die for our sins. And because of that, Lord, we thank you because the payment for our sin has been made. All we have to do now is place our faith and our trust in you. And for those of us who have done that this morning, Lord, we say thank you. But we also know that there's a great number of people who do not know you personally. And Lord, I pray specifically this morning, I pray that you would touch every man, woman, boy, and girl, God, and in the depths of their heart, Lord, that they would realize that they desperately need a relationship with you. Salvation is not based upon what we do, but on what you have already done. So Lord, I pray that you would encourage each one of us here this morning, that we would be your hands and your feet we love you, Lord. Thank you so much for loving us. And we pray all of this in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. Kingdom builders are dismissed. You can go. Uh, if you've got kiddos that are headed back there, they can go back. And we're going to continue in a time of worship. So you join with us.
that third verse one more time. But I don't want us to just sing it because it's words on a screen. I want us to think about what it means. Church, he is coming back. We don't know when, but he defeated death, hell, and the grave. He is victorious, and we are victorious through him. And in him may we be found. And then it says, dressed in his righteousness alone. It is nothing that you have done. It is nothing that I have done. It is his grace and his mercy alone. But because of that, church, don't miss this part. We will be faultless to stand before the throne. He died for our sins. He paid the penalty. He paid the price. And we get to stand victorious because of that. Let's sing that again like we believe it this morning, okay? When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his Because you are our cornerstone. We praise you for all that you've done for us. Because we are victorious through you. We don't have to live defeated. We don't have to live broken. No matter what storm we're facing. Because your word tell, tells us that it's in our weakness. God, you work in our weakness. And that's how we're made strong through you. It's nothing about us. Lord, we just pray right now that you would hide your messenger behind the cross. Open our ears and open our hearts to receive your word, to believe your word, and to live your word. Father, challenge us and change us. Mold us into who you want us to be. I pray that if there's anyone lost in this place today, that today would be the day of salvation. I pray for those who are facing challenges and storms that you would comfort them. I pray for those who are running away from you, God, that they would come back and realize that you are steadfast. Lord, we love you. We thank you for this time to worship you. We praise you for who you are. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 If you'll remain standing just a moment longer. Just a moment longer. We're going to read this morning and hear from the book of Acts, continuing our, uh, our series through Acts, and we're going to learn a little bit about Stephen this morning. Uh, not so much the tail end, but the life of Stephen. And so if you will, turn with me. Acts 6, uh, beginning in verse chapter 8. Uh, love to hear those pages flipping. Uh, be reminded this morning we... Um, are following from the beginning of 6, where we've talked about the seven that are chosen to serve. Though we don't see the word deacon there, we, we see that there's a model here uh, that could be given for a deacon. And Stephen here is one of those uh, people that are set aside. And there's a specific phrase that Scripture has been using, um, and, and it's being full of uh, the Holy Spirit and wisdom And so we're going to continue on as we see a very unique story here. So would you follow along with me? Acts chapter 6, 8 through um, 15, and the beginning of verse uh, 1 there in chapter 7. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. Then there arose some from what is called the synagogue of the freemen, 
the Cyrenians, Alexandrians, and those from Cilicia and Asia, disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. Then they secretly induced men to say, We have heard him speak blasphemous blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up the people, the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him, seized him, and brought him to the council. Then they also set up false witnesses who said, This man does not cease to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs which Moses delivered to us. And all who sat in the council, looking steadfastly at him, saw his face as the face of an angel. Then the high priest said, Are these things so? You may be seated this morning. This is the word of the Lord. We see here perhaps a great example of a life that is probably worth modeling in many, many ways. And yet we know such little information about Stephen. All we really have is chapter 6 and 7 with the reply that he's going to give. And so this morning, church, I I want us to kind of examine uh, what it looks like to be full of uh, wisdom and the Spirit. I want us to walk away after examining the life of Stephen, knowing that you and I, We can learn from this text in such a way that is not just a, well, look at him, look what he did, but what does God want to do with you today? And what does that look like? The title of this message is going to be Rules and Relationship. It's a phrase you're going to hear quite often as we comb through this text. Um, Let me pose this question. We, I think we would agree that Is Christ worth dying for? What's that? Good. Is he worth living for? That's what we want to focus on this morning. What does it mean to live for Christ? And so we immediately see this set up in verses 8 and 9, right? We see the people. We see Stephen. We see a man full of faith and power doing signs and wonders. It's evident God is using him in a miraculous, mighty way. Be reminded uh, that every time we see a miracle happen in the book of Acts, it's not about the miracle. It's about recognizing that the authority of that miracle happening means that the authority of the gospel is real. So if God can heal the lame man that couldn't walk, he can also then forgive him of his sin, which is greater, to be forgiven of the sin. And so as Stephen is doing signs and wonders among the people, it's not about the signs and wonders. It's about the God who has given the ability for signs and wonders to happen, which means that Jesus really is the authority that really can and has been throughout the book of Acts changing people's lives. So Stephen's just doing what Stephen does, right? He's just being faithful. But then you have another group, the freedmen. Now this group are Jewish people who were once in captivity. They were once slaves, but have been released from that. Uh, We see that there's a a specific group, but what's interesting to kind of note here is that, uh, you know, John uh, talked about the the Hellenists and he talked about uh, the Jewish people. We would say that these people here would uh, relate more to the Hellenists, which guess what? That's who Stephen is as well, right? They were being neglected in the daily distribution. And so Stephen has been set apart to take care of that kind of ministry. But then you have these people who come from slightly similar backgrounds. And, well, the irony here is that they have a similar background, and yet they are so different. Why is this? Because one was following rules, and one had 
a relationship. And so then we see a dispute, right? In verses 9 through 10 here. Then there arose some of them, right? And they were not able to dispute with Stephen because they couldn't resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. Wisdom and spirit. And we're going we're gonna to get into that a little bit later. But I just want you to understand that uh, we can't have wisdom without knowledge. You can't have knowledge without acquiring knowledge. You can't acquire knowledge if you don't learn or study or invest in that thing that would bring you knowledge. You can't have the Holy Spirit if you don't have a relationship with Jesus. You can't be sensitive to the Spirit if you're not connecting with God. We have good reason to believe here that Stephen was doing both of these things, and we'll dive into that, right? Here's how we know that he had to have gained the knowledge, though. If wisdom is a reflection and application of knowledge, think about his background for a minute. He's the Hellenist, right? He, he's not part of the, uh, the original in crowd, right? He's an outsider. He would have had to take the time to sit under the apostles' teaching. He would have had to take in the time to invest in learning what God's word was. This did not come naturally to him, church. And of all people and of all backgrounds, he would have been the least likely to have been formally trained in the scriptures. But he knew. He knew. So he invested. He learned. He studied. And we see he's full of the Spirit, which simply means he's empowered by God. It means he's spending time with him. He's praying. He's seeking, reading his word, engaged in prayer, in fellowship with the church, right? Because the church at this point is what? What are they doing? They're sitting under the apostles' teaching, right? And they're breaking bread together, and they're meeting house to house. It's a beautiful time in the church, and now we start seeing disputes, and we start seeing disagreements, and we start seeing this and that, and uh, we've never seen that before, have we? And they could not resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. So what do they do? We see the response. They secretly induced men to say, verse 11, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up the people, the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him, seized him, and brought him to the council. They also set up false witnesses who said, This man does not cease to speak blasphemous words against his holy place in the law. <clears throat> For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs which Moses delivered to us. Now, just a reminder, Stephen has said and done nothing wrong. Right? And they know that because they can't resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he speaks. He's done nothing wrong. So then they deceive and they lie and they stir up people. They form this group to come against him. Church, can I tell you something? Serving the Lord doesn't always mean that people are going to receive it. You can pray, you can study, you can be obedient, you can do everything correct for Jesus. You may not be liked because of it. Things may go wrong because of it. People may not respond. They even understood. They couldn't argue against Him, and yet they would rebel. How's that work? Because this is a spiritual warfare here. This is light and darkness. And when light exposes darkness, I'll get ready for the bats to come flying out. It's not until somebody is receiving that, right? Jesus, the parable of the sower on good soil, that it finally takes root. And there's finally deep roots and fruit that will grow and produce a hundredfold. Now Stephen, you know, he, he knew his circumstances. 
He doesn't really resist that, does he? Now, we get hung up in this. We see this a lot. He did nothing wrong, but he's being accused. Should we get defensive right now? Should we start fighting for what's right? Should we, uh, should we post up here and be like, nope, you're not taking me. I ain't getting stoned today. No. That's not what he does. And yet, I can't help but think, but we, we look at our world today, don't we? And, and we, we wonder why the world is the way it is. And it's almost like, church, if we're not careful, we really want the world to reflect our Christian values, but we're unwilling to go into the world that doesn't have any of those values and be the light to the world. Y'all hear me on this? I don't know if you hear me on this. Do we want the world to be like us? Or are we willing to settle and say, you know what? The world is lost. It's dark. It's gone. Let's go in it and rescue some folks. Let's go get them. Which one do we want? So then we see what Stephen does here, the result, right? And all who sat in the council looking steadfastly at him saw his face as the face of an angel. What a cool verse, right? So at first he says nothing. See that? It's really deep theological there. No words. He doesn't defend himself. He doesn't stand up for himself. He probably knows that if he's being accused of blasphemy, he may not live long. He doesn't try to escape it. But God is with him. Now, this description here, uh, the appearance of the face of an angel, can mean two things here, right? It can simply be kind of a metaphor here, like he looked a certain way. He had the face of an angel, right? So for like a good example would be like, if you need to know what that looks like, you could probably look at my wife, Becca. And that would give you the picture of a face of an angel, right? You see what I'm saying there? Yeah, we earn points. We earn points there, right? Maybe. Now, the other thing it could mean, which I lean towards, kind of echoes when Moses was on Mount Sinai and he spends time with the Lord, right? He comes down off that mountain. He had to cover his face Because the glory of God was upon him. What a cool picture. It seems to echo that as we dig. So here's what we know. God's favor is upon Stephen in this moment. He says nothing. Man, that's a life worth living. It also means it's a death worth dying. Stephen here is going to exemplify truly to live as Christ and to die is gain. To live is Christ. That's where we are. To live is Christ. To die is gain. Just a side note here. The irony that the person that wrote that, um, spoiler alert, is the person that's also um, currently in this chapter greenlighting his execution. Odd, isn't it? Because God can reach those kind of folks. That's the power of the gospel, church. When we live a life with Christ, when we have fellowship with God, you might face some things that uh, put you in a bad circumstance like this, but it doesn't matter, does it? Because you know that you have Christ and Christ has you. Right? When we think of our walk with Jesus, our relationship with Christ is like a marriage. Another spoiler, it is a marriage. Ephesians 5. I know we talk about marriage and all that stuff. It it is about that marriage, but the greater scheme here is that it's about the gospel, Christ and his church. So let's just take a hard look right now. If your relationship with Jesus is a marriage, how healthy does your marriage look? Because marriage involves what? Time. Presence, emotion, thought, care. A lot of things that come with a marriage. Married folks say amen. Amen. Y'all know it. I know it. So if our marriage is supposed to look like the relationship we have with Christ, how is that marriage doing? Because Stephen's right now, it looks pretty good. 
And it wasn't just a moment. It was a life of discipline. It was a life of striving. It was a life. He didn't come from that same background, guys. He had to work. He had to discipline. He had to sit under the teaching. He did all those things, and it led to this moment. Right? We know more about God by by understanding what His Word says, and we connect with God by prayer and by fellowship with Him through His Spirit and, and through His church. Now, let me throw this at you. We don't know much about Stephen. What if he was married? What if he had kids? We don't know. The Bible doesn't explicitly say this. Would our response change as we're being questioned about blasphemy? Oh, but my, my wife, my kid. I bet if he were married, I bet if he had a family, I bet his response is the same. I bet he doesn't defend his right of innocence. Because that's not what happens. What does happen? (laughs) Chapter 7, verse 1, Then the high priest said, Are these things so? So what would we do? How do we reply? Now, if you notice... Chapter 7, it's the longest chapter in the book of Acts. I read this out loud at home, and it took about six minutes to read out loud. So what Stephen does here is he gives a response, not about himself, but about the reality of what they're accusing him of. He gives them God's word, right? He starts with Abraham and the covenant. He moves into Isaac. He's going to shift into Jacob and Joseph and the 12 tribes. And that's going to lead to David and Solomon and 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 God's dwelling place. And then ultimately, he's he's, he's just going to end this with, y'all don't get it. But he lays out in six minutes almost the entirety of the Old Testament. No help, no support, just boom, go. Let me ask you something. How many of us could do that right now. Six minutes. Summarize the Old Testament from the beginning to Christ, what it means, how the law fits in, and what that means for the people that are listening who have studied the law their whole life. Could we do that? I'm going to be honest, I I might struggle through that a little bit. Wouldn't you? That feels intimidating. But when we live a life that chases God in His Word and is sensitive to His Spirit, man, He's going to use it. And the question is, do we want to be used? He was full of... Of wisdom. Now, i got to point something out here. Really crucial. Some of y'all would say, well, pastor, you ought to know how to summarize the Old Testament in six minutes. You ought to be able to do that. That's what we pay you for, right? Something like that. We'd say that. Be ashamed. If I had never read the Bible from front to back, that would be weird. I think that would be weird. Would that be strange? Help me out here. I think that would be strange. Is Stephen a pastor? Y'all can answer this if you want to. Is Stephen a pastor? No. Wait, what? Well, he's a deacon. Well, that's not the word used there either, is it? Guys, he's, he's just a man. He's just a person. Like all of you, like all of me, like he's just a person. How is it a person can be filled with such wisdom and have... The Spirit. He's just a person. So what does that mean for us? We can be used by God in a similar fashion. If we'll discipline, if we'll study, if we'll equip ourselves with the knowledge, if we'll pray, if we'll seek, if we'll lay down whatever it is we have, and we'll lay it down for His sake, because is Jesus worth living for? Yes. But that means something. It doesn't mean that we don't invest in these things. It, it, it can't work that way, right? 
So we see a beautiful picture here. A man who is ready. He's living a life. He's prepared to die. He's ready. He's ready in any season. He's not perfect. None of us are. And look at the people here. Who is he talking to? He's talking to the people that are supposed to know this word. And he points something out really crucial here. I'm not going to read all of chapter 7. But look with me at verse 48 through 51. He points out something crucial here. This was one of the main issues. However, the Most High does not dwell in temples made with hands, as the prophet says. Heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. What house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Has my hand not made all these things? We'll stop right there. So issue number one, these people are operating in such a way that they believe God is still in the temple. You've got to go and meet God where God is. This is what they're going to be arguing for, right? This is, this is Old Testament. This is what they would have known and studied. Now, just so you know, what they've known and studied is clearly twisted, mixed in, sprinkled in with their own wants, desires, needs, and thus it kind of, it kind of voids it. Okay. But God is in a place, and God is not in people. Stephen is demonstrating that God is in his people. This is the whole thing with Pentecost. This is the whole deal. When we get saved, we have the Holy Spirit living in us, no longer dwelling in man-made buildings, no longer in a spot. We're thankful to have a spot, but it's the people. It's the people of God, right? And, and, and you know, if we sang, He lives during this time, we'd all get killed. He lives, He lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, He lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know He lives, He lives in my heart. Congratulations, we would all be killed for singing this today. Because that's not what they understood. What they understood was God is in a place, he's not in his people. So then, for us, if God is in his people, then it matters what we do outside of the building. Right? Am I onto something here? This is a special time where we get to worship Christ. We are blessed with this building in this space. We call it, we refer to it as God's house, right? Because it's the place that we come that we know that we're going to hear more about Christ. We're going to hear more about the gospel. We're going to be trained and equipped. But the six other days a week, God is still with you if you're a Christian. So if Jesus is sitting next to you the six other days, who? Are we okay with what he sees us do? What we listen to? What we scroll on? What we like? Are we cool with that? I'm not cool with that. That's a struggle. But really, church, boil it down with me here. Do we, do we really think he's with us the other six days a week? Because if he did, if we did, I, I think we would act different. I think we would live a little different, right? We'd change what we listen to. We'd, we'd change what we invest in. Now, on the other side of that is a whole other deal where we think if we do A, B, and C, we do all the rules, we get it right, then we're good. That's not it either. That's not going to work. This audience was trying to follow the rules. And then Steve is going to call them out for it. Because the main issue here, issue number two, was the idolatry of their heart. Right? He says in verse 51, You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, and so do you. He just called them out. He said, you don't know what we're talking about. You don't have a relationship. All you have is your rules. And even your rules, what he's going to get to, you broke all of them. You're guilty. You can't make it. Now, we're talking about unbelievers here, right? 
very evident, very evident. We're talking about unbelievers, right? So these people do not know Jesus. So we, as the church, not ought to look anything like them. The question is, do we? Do we look like this? Do we get defensive over rules? Do we get defensive over maybe traditions? Do we get defensive over our own culture? Do we fight people because this kid said this at the ball game and now we can't reconcile anymore because they said something mean? We have standards, people. We have rules. We just don't realize it. But let me point something out here. I'm, traditions, rules, I'm cool with it. I'm good with it, but, but hear me on this. When rules and traditions are made apart from a relationship with God, that's not rules and tradition, that's idolatry. Should I say that again? When rules and traditions are made apart from a relationship with God, it's not tradition or rules, it's idolatry. Do you all hear me on this? Maybe for myself, that's fine. Because I got it too. Idolatry is not the worship of Christ. That might be the worship of self. That might be the worship of another God. An unnamed God that we haven't called out yet. That we haven't put down yet. If anything we do is not reflective of the relationship, it's no good. It's no good. And we've got to be careful. Because when that gets exposed... It normally ends badly, right? Like I'm already lighting a fire this morning right now. One of two things is going to happen. <laughs> People are either going to go, oh, that's right. I need to turn. I need, I, Lord, I need to repent for that. Or there's going to be rebellion. I may not be here next Sunday. I won't be here next Sunday. I'll be on vacation. So don't think that my absence <laughs> led to something bad, okay? It's, it's, it's all good. It's all good. But when this kind of thing happens, it does expose. And when it expose, exposes things, it's going to lead to one of two things, repentance or rebellion. That's what's going to happen. We need both His Word and His Spirit. We need to know the Word. We need to be living by His Spirit. You, you can't do one or the other. It's got to be the fellowship of both. That's what God wired us for in Christ. It's what he made us for, right? And I would love to say, I would love to say, you're going to hear some encouragement, I promise. Because I don't think of this church as having as much of a struggle as I do other churches that either I've seen or served at. I wish we could say this morning that churches do not struggle with this concept. Well, let's ask the question. Do churches struggle with this kind of concept? Yes and amen. You know, there's a church I served at. And I was at a business meeting, and uh, one of our youth leaders walked in. He had a ball cap on. And I was sitting next to a couple, a uh, very prominent couple, like been in the church forever. And um, well, they didn't like that ball cap on. And uh, they, they happened to be sitting next to me. I was the wrong person to be sitting next to for this kind of conversation. I was the wrong person. I'll tell you all why in a minute. Because if they had known about me, they would have known that when I was 14, I went to Mass. I was Catholic. I was raised Catholic. Went to a private Catholic school. I followed the rules. Knew the apostles. I knew the Ten Commandments. I knew it all, guys. I knew it. I was told when you get confirmed, you're going to be an adult in the church. And I'm going, yeah. I want to I be a part of the church. This is what confirmation usually does, right? Like, you're You're in. I got confirmed. Well, I walked in with a black T-shirt and ripped jeans. If you've been in our new members class, y'all have heard me say this story. I walked in, black T-shirt, ripped jeans. Remember, I'm an adult in the church, and I'm part of the church. I sure didn't feel like it. Not one person talked to me. Not one person sat with me. My, the whole pew was empty until the very end of it. Guys that were in suit and ties, people dressed up, they're glaring at me. Glaring. 
I'm not kidding. You know what that led to? I never went back. I never went back. And if I hadn't read about Martin Luther, I probably wouldn't have gone back to church either. So I ended up in a Lutheran church. Because I'm going, well, I mean, I got some, I got some issues. I, I don't, why confession? Why the Lord's Supper becoming the literal, literal body and blood of Jesus? Which, by the way, is like medically, like, what, what is Jesus' blood type? Because, like, if it don't jive with me, I'm going to have a problem. I'm not going to make it. I had questions. So I left, and I went to this Lutheran church, which is very similar in tradition and worship, right? Well, I walk in. What am I wearing? Black T-shirt, ripped jeans. That is who 14, 15-year-old Matt Cowan, long curly hair. I don't have a picture. We could get that sometime. I walk in. What do I see? On the stage, biker-looking dude, ripped jeans, black T-shirt, electric guitar, spikes, chains, long hair, goatee, 845 worship service. He's playing in the praise band. I'm like, whoa, if this dude can be here, I can be here. That's awesome. I stayed there throughout high school. And it wasn't until college that I got involved with the Baptist church. Right? Some of y'all are like, praise God. <laughs> I know, don't be scared. It's okay. It's okay. We can talk about that later. <laughs> I'm ordained, by the way, too, by the Baptist. Just so y'all know. Okay, I'm not some, some crazy nut out here. But look, as long as we agree on the gospel on the death and resurrection of Jesus, I don't care how you worship. I don't care. I don't care. You hear me on that? Yeah. I, I would even say that there's Catholics. Okay, I don't agree with what Catholics do in some of the practice, but I would say this. There are some Catholics that are probably far more devoted in the Word and in prayer than you and I have ever tasted. They'll do more praying and reading in a week than we have done in a year. Lutherans, if we agree on the basis of salvation as Christ alone, not by works, by faith alone, I'm with you. I'm with you because there's something that happens here, right? You get the Holy Spirit. He changes you. He makes you to who you're supposed to be in Christ. Was that in my notes? No, it was not. That's okay. But I went to that church because I saw a guy that he was accepted for being who he was. That's what kept me in church. And I would come to Christ a year after that, outside of that Lutheran church. I would have an incredible encounter with Christ and surrender my life to Him. Now, would that have happened if I had been out of church? I don't know. I don't know if we get it this morning. It's not about the rules. It's about the relationship. And so, I say all that back to this other church because I'm sitting, serving at this church. This youth leader walks in, ball cap on. This couple sits next to me. And if they had known I was the wrong person to sit next to, they say, do you think you could go and tell him to take his, his hat off? And I said, I just don't think this is really the time to do that right now. Let's, let's have a conversation after this. I thought that was pretty respectful. I thought I did pretty good. She didn't like that. She didn't like that. She, she said, okay, okay. And she got up and they left and they never came back. See, I don't know if you got this by now, but I didn't come from y'all's world. <laughs> I wasn't raised Baptist. I wasn't raised in this culture. I, literally, the first time I read the Bible through was because the church I was at, this is Webster Baptist and Silva, they were going through the Bible in a year. I'd never read the Bible through before. I struggled from from 15 to 20 because I didn't have people telling me this is what you needed, this is what you do, this is what it means to be a Christian. I had the Spirit convicting me of my sin, but I had little knowledge of who God was by His Word. So we start reading this. So I'm reading things coming up like He came for the sick and not the healthy, right? Not the righteous, but the sinners. I'm reading First Peter 3 that we don't let our adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be hidden, the hidden person of the heart with incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit that is precious in the sight of God. That's for the ladies in First Peter, right? Then I'm reading James 2, Do not show favoritism 
to the one with gold rings and fine apparel and give them the best seat while neglecting the poor that come in to worship. Like for me, all I had was the Bible. I'm not saying I knew everything. I certainly, I do not and I did not. But my basis of how we worship did not come from anything other than what I thought the Bible was telling us. So I didn't know that things like ball caps and tattoos were an issue. Seriously, I, that wasn't me. A couple weeks ago, I had a funny but not funny conversation about tattoos. Now, I don't have any. <clears throat> it's a very deep theological reason that I'd like to share with you this morning. Okay? Because the one that I would want is too expensive. It's true. I mean, I could probably get a tattoo of like my wedding band, right? And then some of y'all freak out because you're like, well, Matt, what if your spouse dies? Anybody, if you have a tattoo of a wedding band, let me just encourage you. You just tell them, well, if I'm not married to my spouse, I'm still married to Jesus. Y'all like that? That's good. That's good. Because it's permanent. So is salvation. So rock it, people. Should I do a show of hands who has their wedding band tattooed? I don't know. We don't have to do that. That's fine. And some of us, right, we hear that and we go, hold up. Wait, I don't like that. I don't like it, right? Because here's the deal. I've always wanted a tattoo. But if I'm going to do it, I'm going to go big, okay? I was having a conversation with somebody. I want John 1 swirled around my arm. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And we could cut to verse 14, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Now, Becca said, if I ever got a tattoo, I can only get one on. I can't get two. Now, if I got the other one, let me tell you all what I'd do there. <laughs> I get Ephesians 6. I get the shield of faith right here. Okay, why? You've got the armor of God, you've got the shield of faith, but the Word is the sword in that text. So you've got sword and shield. Pretty cool, right? It's like $10,000 right there, so we can't, can't do it. I had this conversation with this, this brother here, and he said, uh, so you want to get a tattoo? I said, yeah, that'd be awesome. He said, well, I know a guy. I'm like, say what? What'd you say? He said, no, I know a guy. He, he's got tattoos. He shows me his tattoos, and they look good. And I'm like, oh, no. He's like, you don't got to worry about cost. Like, we can, we can get you hooked up. This man is, he's serious. And I'm going, I don't know. So I got a tattoo I want to show you. I'm just kidding. I don't have the tattoo. I don't have it. That makes you think, though, doesn't it? So suddenly, this desire could become a reality. But, man, all I could think was, like, what would my church think? What, what would these people think? I'm a pastor. Like, could, like, one, when I get fired from Calvary Road for having a full sleeve tattoo of John 1, could I go somewhere else? Like, would that be accepted? And I wrestled so hard. He's sitting in here today, dude, I had a conversation with. I see you up there. I'm not looking at you. Okay, so we'll talk later. I, I need to pray some more. I don't. But, man, it made me think. How much of a problem do we really have with that? Because here's the deal, right? We're going to push back. We're going to go, well, Leviticus, right? We're going to go, don't have any tattoo marks or markings on your body. Let me read that for us, right? Because th this is where we get hung up. <laughs> Leviticus 19. You shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor tattoo any marks on you. I am the Lord. We go, hallelujah, we're done. Okay. I'm sorry. I should have read the verse before that. Let's read the verse before that. 27, you shall not shave around the sides of your head, nor you shall disfigure, you shall not disfigure the edges of your beard. I tried that once, y'all didn't like it. <laughs> y'all didn't like it, I was trying to be biblical. It's fine. Long beard, no tattoos, I'm just trying my best. You can't have one without the other. Right? It's what the law says. No tattoos, no markings. 
fellas, don't trim your beard. So we better start, Calvary Road. It's time. Mark, I know there's issues here. God's grace is sufficient for you, my brother. Dan, you ain't never had a problem with growing hair out. I, everybody in here, they're jealous, okay? I've, I've been told. But look, I, we joke, but that verse has been used out of context many times. How many preachers you heard? How many people you heard say, well, we don't get tattoos because that's a sin against God. Now, specifically, it does say, right, we're not making any cut in your flesh for the dead or tattoo marks on you. So for the dead is one thing. There is that. But it was also a pagan ritual. Like tattoos back then and tattoos today, they're, they're not exactly the same. And we can talk more about that later. But if we're going to take that seriously, we're going to also have to take seriously not shaving the sides of our head, fellas, and, and growing out our beards. You can't just do one and not the other. You can't do that, right? If you back up, um, verse 19, you shall keep my statutes. You shall not let your livestock breed with another kind. You shall not sow your field with mixed seed, nor shall a garment of mixed linen and wool come upon you. Mixed linen and wool. Guess what? We all just failed. Mixed fabric. We're done. So which is it? <laughs> what do we do about this? Now I bring this up. Y'all might be thinking, Matt, you have gone off the rails on this. Aren't the people that Stephen's talking to about the law? We're going to read it. We're going to know it. We're going we're to live it. Because what, what does he say to them? If, if you flip back in Acts 7, look at verses 52 and 53 of 7. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one, of whom you now have become the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the direction of angels and have not kept it. Have not kept it. They can't even keep the law. They probably barely know it because they mix it in with their own rituals and traditions because it's not about the law. It's not about God at that point. It's about them. So this issue that we're talking about. So important, right? Jesus came and fulfilled the law, but we don't disregard it because it's still a reflection of God's moral character, right? But we're no longer bound by it. <laughs> because ultimately, if they had understood the coming of the Messiah, they would have understood this. We can't keep the law. It's too perfect. God is too holy. He's too righteous. We can't keep it. We need someone that can pay this atonement. We need someone that can follow the rules and come on our behalf. That's what Jesus did. He's God in the flesh. So God sends himself in the flesh. Son of God comes, lives a life that we cannot, keeps the whole law, and then gives himself up as the living sacrifice for our sins. And he proves he has the authority because he rose on the third day. They couldn't accept that because they wanted God in their building and they wanted their rules to be their rules and God to be them. Jesus is the only one that could do this. And when he does this, we're no longer supposed to be submitting ourselves to a yoke of slavery. That's what it says in Galatians. You're free, church. In Jesus, you're free. You're not meant to be slaves anymore. So it, does it matter how we worship? Does it matter what we wear? Does it matter what we do? No. And yet, it does, doesn't it? If I showed up today to preach in a t-shirt and jeans, would the word of God be any less powerful? I might be fired, but that's not the question I'm asking. 
would the word of God be any less powerful? But there's an awkwardness here, isn't there? Because y'all are thinking, you're crazy enough to take the coat off and throw it. You're probably right. But remember, my whole background is different. I wore this today for y'all. You're not going to catch me in this at home. You're not. It's just not who I am. I would wear literally a, a, a shirt and jeans and these boots. I got my boots because I ride the motorcycle. I can't, I, I can't wear dress shoes and ride a bike. Okay, I'm sorry. I can't. You know, and I don't want to harp on this too much, but if you look at if you look at why people dressed up for church, if you look at the history of it, you're going to find two main things. You're going to find days of segregation. You're going to see where when blacks were allowed to go to church, they had to dress up to identify themselves as being able to go to church. They didn't have a choice. You're also going to see things like the Industrial Revolution where Class became a thing, like middle class entered into the world, and you have then these different folks with different wealth. And literally, if you dig into that further, what you're going to find is that when people would go to church, they would purposely show up in the finest apparel because they literally wanted to show everyone else how wealthy they were. And they thought that God was pleased with that. Now, today it's different, right? I hope none of us are showing up in a suit or a fancy dress or anything because we're trying to show our worth. That would be terrible. You know, but the difference here (coughs) is that when we look and examine why we do what we do, if it comes from a place with having a relationship with Christ, fantastic. If dressing up, makes you feel like I'm trying to be reverent. I'm trying to present myself in such a way that is pleasing to God. That is perfectly okay with me. But what would not be okay is if you look at everybody else that's not doing it and you condemn them for it. That's the difference. I have no issue with the clothes that are wore on a Sunday morning. I have no issue with tattoos or ball cap. I don't. Some of you may. And that's fine. But Jesus said to worship in spirit and in truth. It's not about the outward appearance. It's about what's going on in here. It's not ever been about following rules. Because again, rules and traditions that are made apart from a relationship is idolatry. What do we do with idols? We tear them down. That's what's supposed to happen. I mean, guys, let's let's get real here. How many times does my generation, I'm 32, let's say people in their 30s and people in their 20s, how many times do you invite somebody to church and they ask you, what do I have to wear there? Right? Anytime I've invited somebody to church, it's the first question. Can I wear jeans? Can I? Now here, I am pleased, so pleased to say, ah, You can wear jeans. I think it'll be fine. Right? It's okay that we wear jeans on Sunday morning. Amen. Thank you. God bless you. See, I don't don't have that fight here. It's probably the first time I've not had that fight here. That's sad. Every other place, like, I had to tell people, oh, you need, you better tuck in the shirt. You better get some khakis. Like, you better... Don't come with the ball cap. But man, again, we've got a problem. Why is it Sunday again are the, are the worst uh, times for a server to make money? Isn't it the church people? Can I tell you all something? I've been a server. Worked at Brio Tuscan Grill at the casino. Some of y'all are like, you worked at the casino? Yeah, I did. I had to make a living, people. <laughs> Youth ministry wasn't cutting it. 
It's part time. Couldn't do it. Worked at the casino. You know when my worst days were? Sundays. I was serving in ministry then. And I'm going I'm to tell you all something. Church people were the absolute, absolute worst people to serve a table for. They were the most demanding. They were the most hostile. They were hypocritical. They were judgmental. They were just mean. You know what they were wearing? Suit and tie. Fancy dress. Earrings. Necklaces. You see, I don't... I know this, this is probably weird for y'all, but where y'all have come from a, a, a different place here in the mountains, that the suit and tie, the dress, it meant reverence. For me, it meant hypocrisy. Every time, I would think, what are they trying to cover up? Why do they look so fancy on the outside? What's going on on the inside? What, what, what are they trying to hide here? And I'm not going to lie to you, I... Uh, I still struggle with that at times. Because listen, I show up to the funerals and the weddings and church, and I put on the jack of it. That's to appease man. But anytime I thought about showing up to church, I'm aiming to appease God, who doesn't look at the outward appearance, but he looks at the heart, according to 1 Samuel, when King David was being chosen to be king over Israel. You know, what's neat about working at Brio was... I got hired on the spot because there were people from my church that were already working there. And the manager loved them so much that anybody that came in for a job that came from Webster, she'd hire on the spot. They were the most consistent. They were the most respectful. They never got angry. They did their job well. They did their side work well. And by the time I left, there were still people from that church working there. There might still be today. I really don't know. What was it about then? It's about what's going on in here. It's about the heart. It was about their worship. Because when we, it's not about the clothes, guys. Clothes are not the enemy. But we got to examine if what we do is based on rules or a relationship. True conviction doesn't come from rules. It comes from the relationship. And a relationship with God is based on His Word, His Spirit, and His church. Rules and tradition must first be based on that relationship. So Stephen, full of wisdom and the Holy Spirit, knowing His Word knowing what God says about these things, knowing Him because it is His Word. It's living and active. It's breathed out by Him. And so if His Word says something contrary to how we're living or what we're doing, we ought to examine ourselves and be willing to shift something. We've got to, right? Like I said, I, I put on the coat for you guys. I do. It's not my favorite thing, but I do it because ever since I got to Haywood County, I've been trying to learn the language of the mountain people. I still don't know half the phrases y'all use, and I'm working on it. I've done everything I can to reach those in Haywood County and at Calvary Road, all while knowing I'll never be accepted as a mountain person. Some of y'all have said that to me. That's fine. I don't know the mountain sayings. I didn't know that buttermilk was such an issue around here. <laughs> Literally, all I know about buttermilk is that the best homemade ranch is made with regular milk and not buttermilk. Okay? That's all I know. Some of y'all don't put ranch on everything like I do. It's okay. That's a Wisconsin thing. But I think we'd agree. We all have something to learn from one another, right? Because if our rules and traditions are not based on us, but based on our relationship with God, we're different parts of the body. We function differently. We get along because we have Christ, not because we agree on certain things 
about how we ought to live. As long as it's biblical, right, we, we, can, we can agree and disagree on that premise. But if it's anything outside of that, guys, it doesn't matter. It does not matter. It doesn't matter the kind of music we sing. It doesn't matter what we wear. It, again, the other six days of the week, isn't that just as important as a Sunday morning? But, look, I'm just the foreigner here. I'm the Hellenist. Right? Calvary Road, church is here, the mountain folk. You guys are like the old school Jewish community. You've been here. You know it. I'm just an outsider. That's, that's what I am, right? It's not fun to be the outsider. You know, but I thought coming to Haywood County... When I left Silva, I thought that being a foreigner, that people would love the foreigner. Because that's even what Levitical law says. It says to treat the foreigner among you as one of your own. Not to neglect them. Essentially, it's saying treat them as your own family. When I got to Haywood County, I I thought I could be part of a family of God with people that didn't look like me and I didn't look like them. And I learned very quickly that was not the case. I don't have time to go into all that, but uh, don't they call the county Hardwood County for a reason? I mean, if we really peel this back, don't we? Uh, don't some of the mountain folks not like people like me coming in to move in? Am I not ruining mountain heritage and beliefs and values and? But the Bible says to love the foreigner. That's what it says. And I never quite got that until I came here. It's taken me years. You know how many times I've tried to leave Haywood County? Y'all got fingers? I'm just kidding. But man, have I, I have prayed, God, get me out of this county. I've had pastors tell me, hey, you're not going to be able to do much here. You can't pastor here. Don't even try it. I did get away for a minute. And then Mark Golden called me. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Jesus. You know what I found, though, when I got away and I went to Henderson, not to be confused with Hendersonville, not Henderson County, way away, north of Raleigh, Vance County. You know what I found there? They got their own set of rules there, too. And they sound way different. Tobacco, soybean fields, farming, that's that's what you do. That's not what I do. In those couple of years, that was in the middle of COVID. That was, a, that was a good season. But I still had to adjust, right? Still had to earn the right to speak to people. Still had to earn the respect. All the while, I'm trying to anchor in as biblically as possible. So was I effective? I hope so. So then God calls me back to Haywood County. And I'm going, oh, Lord. They don't want me. They don't want me because I'm too different. I see things different. (laughs) And I don't have the traditions and the vow. I I wasn't raised in it. All I've ever known is like (laughs) scripture. And again, I don't know it all, but that's like the basis of what my culture is. I find a lot more freedom than I do chains when I read the Bible about this issue. These guys that fought Stephen, man, they couldn't get over this. God can't live in his people. You know why? Because it would change everything they believed about the rules. They didn't like that. But when I got here, I saw the mix of wisdom and the spirit here at Calvary Row when it comes to this issue of rules and relationships. 
know, back in December, we got sick with COVID and the flu. And almost all of our staff came to the house. Generators, food, drinks. Many of you remember, you came, you showed up. I didn't ask for it because let me tell you all something. I don't ask for help. I've learned that I've got to figure this thing out on my own. That's not the design it's supposed to be, by the way. That's free. That's a sidebar. You're not supposed to be a lone wolf. I've been that my whole life. It doesn't work. We need a community. And y'all showed up where I couldn't do anything. You don't realize the impact that that had on me. That God can work through a community of people when it's based on their relationship with Christ. And it's not based on the rules. It's not based on do with this, don't do that, black and white, whatever. When we love Jesus, we come together. And that's what matters. It's the gospel of, that's the most important factor here. And we may die for it, but it's worth it. I call uh, Danny Moody Papa. Now, Danny Moody, I'm going to show you my weakness right now, okay? We love doing that in the pulpit, don't we, Mark? It's good. John, you understand. We had a little garden. I don't know how big the garden was. Five by eight. I don't, tiny, tiny garden. Well, Danny Moody gets this big old tiller. I don't know how old it is. It's that red one. Jonathan, you know what year that was? Not a clue. It's got to be 70s or 80s. He's kept that thing running hot. Okay? Now, you would think, being from Wisconsin, farmland, dairy, cheese, all the good stuff, right? That I could run that. I can't run that. I've ran a lawnmower. I ain't ran a tiller. So we get the tiller. He shows me what to do. I load it up. I bring it over. I get it in the garden. I'm trying to do everything he showed me what to do, and I can't get it to crank. I can't. I don't know what I did. So I got two choices. Can't YouTube it because the thing, seriously, has got to be 40 or 50 years old. It's not on YouTube. (laughs) I tried, obviously. (laughs) Couldn't get it. So I called Danny Moody. I'm like, hey, I can't get this. All right, hold on. I'll be right there. Comes over. Like 30 seconds later, we live very close. (laughs) I didn't engage the belt. Just one look. So he does that, looks at me, fires up. He proceeds to like till most of the garden because, again, it took about a minute and a half to do. And at the end of it, he goes, you know, I've got a smaller tiller for next season that we could probably use. I'm like, yeah, that's probably a great idea. That's a great idea. Y'all have been doing that your whole life if you're from here. You've got a tiller. You know someone that has a tiller. You've been, you've been doing gardens. You've been doing all this your whole life. I, I haven't. But I'm going to tell you something. My, in my experience from before, I would have thought I would have been scolded. I would have been embarrassed. I would have been just, Matt, you ought to know better. Well, Matt doesn't know better. (laughs) Matt will work hard, but my working hard towards certain things don't look the same. Projects y'all have are not projects I have, but I want to learn. But Danny Moody in that moment, he didn't embarrass me. He didn't even think it was a problem. He knows much more than me. But he didn't shame me for it. He simply just showed me what to do. And that's not what I thought would happen (laughs) when it came to the mountain people of Haywood County. Because listen, if there's one thing I have learned, right, about the mountain community, it's that y'all love Jesus, you keep it simple, you take it a week at a time, And you work harder than any people I've ever met in my entire life. Man, that's something worth having. That's just how y'all are. What a great reflection of being disciplined. What a great reflection 
of being able to work unto the Lord and still giving him the glory when things go well, right? Now, that tradition of mountain heritage can remain. Because we're going to wrap up with this. I, I want to I make sure we got the reality here. That can remain if the love of Christ can be extended out to the lost or to outsiders. It might not be in your family. And I know that that would be a struggle. But if we can sit back and realize, right? Like how many of you, show of hands, are born and raised here? How many are not? Okay, let's take another moment here. How many of you, born and raised here, raise your hand, hold them up. Look around. Take a look. All right. How many are not? Look around. Me too. It's me. We've got something to learn from one another. The church is a family. It's not just acquaintances. It's not just shake your hand on Sunday morning. It's it's a family. Like, I would consider y'all family. You know where my family is? They're in Mooresville. They're probably watching. Hey, Mom. Two and a half hours away. I don't see them much, right? Becca's family, they're in Silva. But we know Jackson County ain't Haywood County. Amen? Come on. (laughs) But here, there is such a sweet spirit that God has been doing in our services. And I think he's trying to unify us together. And again, why do we say all this based on this text? Because one person was following a relationship and the other was following rules. Could it be, church, that there are things in us, myself included, that are not based upon that relationship with Christ, but rather it's just, it is what it is, and I need to get rid of it. Would that be you this morning? Because look, we've got a problem. That was about half and half when we raised hands. You know, our county is projected to, to, to double in 10 years. That's not coming from Haywood County. That's coming from everywhere else. And we can do one of two things. We can hate that and ignore it. Or we can embrace it and go, who does God want to reach out here? Right? Like, do we got any, uh, the mini truck show came to Maggie. We got any mini truckers in here today? Because that'd be really cool. No. How do we reach them? I'm working on the motorcycle thing, okay? There's going to be like a gang or something. We're going to have leather vests. It's going to be awesome. I'm just kidding. But we've got a problem in our churches today. Turnover in children's ministry, in youth ministry, All-time high. All-time high, statistically speaking, right? We've got preachers that, I'm not talking about here, I I mean everywhere else. We've got preachers that don't preach the word, they say what they want. They took a Leviticus 19, said don't get a tattoo, but they didn't read about the beard. They didn't read about the foreigner. They didn't read about mixed fabric. We've got church members who are asleep. Man, they don't want the things of God. They just want their ticket to heaven. What? Come on now. That ain't the gospel. New creation, born again, today. Yes, eternity, but life abundant. Today. And that's not always going to be easy, but it's going to be worth it. Attendance is in decline. Average church member in the country is like 60 and older. People still fighting over carpet. People still mad they didn't sing the solo. People splitting the church because things didn't go their way according to their rules. Hmm. I don't know if I need to say this, but I think I... I think I need to. I mean, guys, we just got news that a 12-year-old took his own life. 
That's the world we live in. A 12-year-old shouldn't ever have to make the decision of whether they want to live or not. I don't know the circumstances. I have no idea. I have no clue. But I know it's not right. I know it's not right. We got to go get them. We got to be in their world. I'm not saying conform to it. I'm not saying conform to the patterns of this world, but rather Romans 12 to present our bodies as a living sacrifice because that's our spiritual worship. What are the things that you and I this morning are holding that aren't of God? What are the ways that God wants to use us this morning? It's only going to be by His Word and it's only going to be through His Spirit. Church, what do we do? Now listen, I just said it, and I want to make sure we hear it clearly as we wrap up. This doesn't come from a change in clothing or traditions. That's not what I'm saying. You can have the traditions. You can have the rules. You can have the customs. You can have the culture. If it's based on your conviction with Christ. That's great. I'm not saying get rid of the jackets. I'm not saying everyone gets a tattoo. But that you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind and love your neighbor as yourself. And I've seen that here. And I see where some of you are making disciples. And I see where some of you are being the pioneers of your family because you weren't shown it, but you're trying your best to live it out biblically. I applaud you. It is not easy. But if we all did that, and if we all invested in the word, and we invested in prayer, oh, man. Maybe we could reach those people that feel like there is absolutely no hope whatsoever. Maybe we can make an impact that we get somebody and rescue them from the fire. And if looking a certain way keeps us from reaching people outside of here, should we maybe adjust that? Maybe. But that's based on conviction. And conviction comes from seeking. (laughs) And seeking comes from having a relationship. So I close with this. Again, if your relationship with Christ is a marriage, how healthy is your marriage this morning? Do you spend time with him? Do you read his word? Are you willing to let him speak to you biblically? And if there's something that we're missing, are we willing to adjust? We learn from the life of Stephen that a life in pursuit of Christ is worth it even if, even if everything else comes against us. If you'll stand to your feet this morning, musicians will come up. Even when trouble comes, Christ is enough. When sorrows come, Christ is enough. Stephen lived a life and fought for this truth. And these other people would fight for themselves. Church, I want to tell you real quick, we fight for what we value the most. And what we worship is a reflection of what we value. So where do you find your arguments? Where do you get upset? Where do you get emotional? God knows it. So if you seek Him first, He'll redeem it. Plain and simple. So to the Christian, to the churchgoer, to all of us contending for the faith, I would say to you, is there anything if we were to ask Christ, what do I need to deal with? How can I be a better witness? Is it from your word? 
Is it by your spirit or is it of me? Would you be willing to lay that down and rest assured that God knows it and wants to redeem it? And then to anyone in here that may not know the Lord, and maybe you, like myself, came from such a background that you thought a relationship with Jesus was based on people and what people did. It's not. Jesus is who he said he was. He came to give life. He came to redeem the lost. And if that's you, having a relationship with Christ is not based on people's standards. People, like me, fail all the time. Right, church? We fail. But a relationship with Christ to those that are struggling, if you know Him, it's based on Him. And He's perfect. And He's holy. And He's righteous. And He wants a relationship with you. If you would turn and surrender your life to Him, He saves, He redeems, He cleanses. And that is who you're meant to be not who you are currently. And so let's let's deal with that this morning if we need to. If you need to come up front, if you need to pray, that would be fine. If you need to deal with that where you are, that is okay. So long, church, as we all seek the Lord. Amen? So let's take this time and respond to Him. Jesus, you're greater. Here we surrender. You are the Savior, Lord of all. Be lifted higher as we bow lower. You are the Savior, greater. And all the praise, all you're greater here we surrender you are the savior lord of all be lifted higher as we bow lower you are the savior Sing that together. All together, I surrender all. Sing that. good to be surrendered to him who gives us life and freedom in himself. Amen. Church, I want to close out with reading part of Ephesians 4 verse 11. And he he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. 
We're constantly learning, constantly growing, and His grace is constantly sufficient. Isn't that good news? A real quick plug, Christ and Culture tonight at 4.30 will talk about uh, some of the church. What is the church, the nature of the church? If you would like to dive in and have a discussion, multi-purpose building at 4.30 tonight. Would love to have you and talk more about even some of these things that we've seen in the Word today. Church, again, um, as I said before, thank you for being an example of what it looks like to walk by His Word and by His Spirit. And uh, my prayer is continuously that we would continue to be equipped for the work of ministry. Amen. I love you. I appreciate you. God bless you. We'll see you soon.